I decided I wanted to work on a problem of my own where I would receive no help from my major professor. And I was interested in what happened to animals after they died. I was interested in the physical conditions of decomposition and the biotic, biotic meaning the living. I was interested in what insects was involved in decomposition and whether the stage of decomposition was dependent on the insect or vice versa, and whether you could use the insects to characterize, characterize the stage of decomposition or the time of death. My research was not original. There had been a lot of people that had worked on decomposition before, but I chose the pig as a model since its skin and everything is closer to a human than anything else. And so to get a research animal, uh, I went through a process of deciding what animal to use. I had tried frogs, chickens, dogs, and cats, and feathers got in the way, fur got in the way, and with using dogs and cats, there was a, per a certain amount of public curiosity. They wanted to know how you got the dogs and cats, whether you killed them, you know, and so forth like that. So that was not a good subject. So I chose the pig because I could get a lot of those in remarkably good shape, ones that I didn't have to kill. Basically, the university let me take a freezer to several pig farms in South Carolina, and the pig farmers gave me the big pigs that are either removed by cesarean operation or died shortly after death or had to be sacrificed for some de disease. They put these in poultry bags, or what we call Ziploc bags now, and put them in the freezer, and when I got a freezer full, I picked up the freezer and then started my research. People had studied decomposition before with different animals. You know, people, you know, ever since the time of Linnaeus, people had noticed where they collected insects, from dead animals or what, or flowers or what, and they put down notes, and then people had noticed which insects you found on dead and decomposing animals of all, all sorts. But there had been few comprehensive studies made. There was one done on sheep in Australia, one done on small mammals in North Carolina, one done on dogs in Tennessee, and various other ones. So I read those papers in reviewing the literature, but what I wanted to do was to characterize the insect community associated with decomposing animals, and at the same time, do the physical characteristics. The temperature of the pig as it was decomposing, the odors, and the weight loss. I could find no records where anybody weighed pigs as they decomposed, or weighed animals as they decomposed. I wanted to find how fast the animal was decomposing. So I weighed all my pigs every four hours. And I kept temperature records, and I kept odor records. And I found that by the end of six days in the summer in South Carolina, and this was a summer carrying study, that 90% of the pigs exposed to insects were gone in six days. 90% was gone in six days. As I used to say, after six days, all you had was a few bones and a hank of hair and a snout or two. You know, you didn't have much. And at the same time, I was comparing pigs that were completely or mostly completely free of insects to see what happened to them how fast it took them to decompose. What happened in six days with insects took well over two months without insects, and it never got down to 10%. They slowly lost their moisture, dried out, dehydrated, and ma mainly became nothing but, you know, peace. Uh, still maintained the form of the pig, but not much weight, and you could have pigs that were free of insects, you could still recognize them as pigs one year later. So I was interested in the whole thing. And then the other part was could I use the insect community to describe the stage of decomposition? They had the fray stage, the bloated stage, the decay stage, and you know, the dry and remain stage. You know, some people had four stages, some people had seven stages of decomposition. So I wanted to see if I could use the insects to outline discrete stages of decomposition, although re realizing that it's a steady process and whether you could put a time on it because once people find you're working with deco decomposing pigs, they automatically think 
that you're using it to estimate the time of death or of a human. You're using it in forensic entomology. You're using it to try to determine the time of death. That was in my mind because some of the same insects that decompose humans also decompose pigs. You know, most of them do. And I was further interested in, later on, which I did for my dissertation, is what happens to, to decomposition of the pig when it's in a different environmental condition. When it's buried, when it's in the water, when it's in different heights above the ground. Because you don't always choose the place you're going to die. As an undergraduate, I had enough chemistry courses to almost be a chemistry major. And in any department of entomology, there's enough chemical compounds lying around so you can do it. So I gathered as many of the chemical compounds that were related to meat decomposition. I got a textbook of meat decomposition or textbook of meat and went through the various breakdown products of protein decomposition and and they had identified the compounds so I collected as many of those compounds from the lab as you could and a lot of them turned out to be scatoles and endoles and mercaptans, things that smell bad but also got some of the fruity odors like the ethyl acetates and the amyl acetates and everything and one thing that I had of both most other students working with decomposition I'm blessed with a good nose a big nose can draw in a volume of air and I can distinguish odors right quick. As people always said, how did you stand it? I never noticed it. I really never noticed the odor of decomposition. I knew it was different and I could tell when I was getting near my study area, but it never bothered me. It bothered a lot of people, but it never bothered me. The only time it's really bad is right after a rain when you have high humidity and there's a lot of moisture. The odor sometimes will stick to your clothes, will stick to your skin. Now, I never said I was welcome into everybody's house because when you stayed out there and worked in that, you did pick up the odor on your clothes and skin. And, and admittedly, it was subjective. But I didn't have many people disagree with me because I'd ask them, would they like to come out and run the, the smell test? No, no, thank you, no, thank you. You know, we'll, we'll trust you. <laughs> And the thing I always noticed that about it, and I, I think I mentioned it in my thesis, when a pig carcass has gone, say, after six days exposed to insects, and it's beginning to dry out, say, maybe three weeks or a month, it becomes dry and leather-like and smells like old musty gloves. But when it rains again and it gets more odors on it, it picks up more odors. But, you know, that's what the insects were orienting to the carcass for. They were orienting, a lot of those insects were coming because of the odors. There is no insect that I know of in South Carolina that could not exist, maybe a blowfly, that could not exist if it didn't have a dead animal because they can feed on uh, uh, feces of animals, regurgitated pellets of owls and hawks. They can feed on rotting mushrooms, rotting free, fruit, any types of manure. A lot of these insects on decomposing animals are barred from other parts in the community. But see, I was just interested, I was interested in what came, but not where they came from. That's a much bigger problem. I was interested in whether they were scavengers, that the carrying was necessary for them, or whether they were predators, or whether they were parasites, or whether they were just coming because they were an assemblage of insects. Because a lot of people don't know you get a lot of butterflies attracted to dead animals. It's quite, uh, quite attractive to see an a eastern tiger swallowtail sitting on a decomposing pig. People wonder why. Butterflies got to eat too. It doesn't take you very long to tell how much a pig weighs. You know, I'm here to tell you, you can weigh one real quickly. But what I came up with was an autopsy balance. This is a, what's well, similar to a meat scale, where I had a basically a stainless steel tray which I put the pig in and then I carried this tray to the balance which was part, the tray was part of the balance and I'd already carried out the way of the tray and set it on the balance and then the weight would come up and you know and I'd write it down and go off and I was weighing in grams and the way I made it easier all of my decomposing pigs were 
uh, in cages on the ground, but between them and the ground was a nylon cloth. I got a, a fish net, a regular fish net, and cut it up in rectangles just big enough to contain the pig. So when I wanted to weigh the pig to pick up the pig and carry it to the autopsy balance, all I had to do was pick up the nylon cloth and put it in the pan and carry it to the autopsy, autopsy balance and weigh them. And a lot of things didn't work. I'm here to tell you, they don't work. Sometimes when you pick up the pig, most of it stays on the ground. You know, the nylon cloth doesn't stay there. That's why I had to use a lot of pigs. Each study I was doing, I had eight cages out, each cage containing a pig. So it was a replicated experiment. And so when I finished with those, I started more and more. You know, I had pigs going all the time in case I ran into problems. But doing the work above ground, this is what I call uh, pigs open to all insects and pigs free of insects. That was much easier than it was doing it in the ground because when I put pigs in the ground, you have to think, how do you weigh a pig in the ground? I was doing weight loss of pigs while they were in the ground. And at the same time, I was photographing them while they were in the ground. And so you started thinking about it. How do you do it? Well, you can't dig up the pig every time. Well, you can, but it's real tedious, laborious, and I wanted the graves to be basically undisturbed. undisturbed. So what I did, for the ones I was making the photographs of, I put them in plexiglass coffins. They were in the ground, laying on the ground on their nylon cloth, but around them was a plexiglass coffin. And I could take the top off and look in. I, you know, I basically looked down the tube and I had my 35 millimeter cal camera calibrated so it was on focus and the pig in the ground. But the weighing part was the difficult part. How do you weigh a pig in the ground? So I said, well, I've got to pick up the pig, okay. So what I decided the best way to do is the thing you weigh meat and fish on is hang a balance from a pole or from a tree above the coffin and have a string going down into the ground to where the pig is and you pick it up and attach it to the balance and you weigh it. And somebody says, how do you do that? Well, all of my pigs, just like when you're in a coffin, when you die and you're in a coffin, there's not dirt on you. You have a surrounding to keep the dirt off, metal covering or wooden covering above you. And so I was just basically picking the pig up in the coffin, just an inch or two off the ground and weighing it. And that worked good until it rained. Sometime when the rain, when it rained, the water table came up, my pigs floated up out of their coffin. Sometimes they floated away. But all of that is nothing compared to when you have pigs in the tree. And I had pigs in trees from heights of four foot above ground to 60 feet above ground. And believe me, you don't want to climb a 60 foot tree more than once to get a pig down and weigh it. So I had mine set up on a system of pulleys. I climbed the tree and tied a pulley system and had the pigs decomposing on a cloth or metal framework. And when I needed them to weigh them, I just lowered them out of the tree, making sure that you never stood under a pig that you were lowering out of a tree because it will rain down maggots and decomposing parts.